Hi everybody, welcome along to uh, the latest webinar in our Dish Oak Spring Coaching Series um, of webinars. We're delighted to be joined by Barry Milan tonight. Um, and Barry is definitely with us tonight. We will say, unfortunately, we had some technical problems last week, which meant that the webinar couldn't go ahead, but um, we're delighted now to have Barry um, ready to go. And uh, Barry has a, a brilliant presentation put together just regards to games-based coaching. Um, so the title of his presentation is Making Every Game Matter. So I suppose the, the idea behind it is that, uh, you know, for you as coaches, the importance of trying to use games-based training to develop your teams, to improve their fitness, to improve their touch uh, and so on. And they prepare your teams for when they're actually going to play um, challenge matches, leagues matches, championship matches over the coming months. Um, so we're, we're really delighted to have Barry um, he's a top class coach with a really, really great reputation nationally and I suppose internationally now at this stage, I suppose, with his involvement with DD Sports Science as well. So um, I suppose without further ado, I'd say we'll introduce and we'll say, Barry, how are you getting on? Good, Barry. Delighted to be on uh, eventually. <laughs> but uh, no, looking forward to it now. Yeah, absolutely. Super stuff, super stuff. And so, Barry, how have you found? Um, it's probably been a, a, a tough time there, I suppose, for all coaches, for all of us. Um, over the last maybe uh, whatever it is, six to nine months, whatever, like how have you found the whole experience or whatever? And are you looking forward as what's the resumption of activities here in the next few weeks? Oh, can't wait to get back. But um, yeah, I found it very difficult. Um, the, the, the last lockdown particularly, I think everybody's in that boat. Um, you know, there's only so much online stuff you can, you can do. And I, I've been lucky to be able to do stuff with Daily Sports Science. But, um, you know, having not been able to do much with the business and I, I'll, I'll explain to everybody what the business is shortly. It was tough going, yeah, but um, look, the the kids are back soon training and can't wait to get back back with them. I'm back in school since yesterday, so it's a it's a start like yourself. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we're, we're, we're back since last week and it's 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 brilliant, actually, even like the kids are kind of buzzing to have coaches coming back into the schools and um, they're really, really excited about going back, um, going back out onto the to the fields for training again for next week. Um, so look, it's an exciting time, and look, it's great to hear that things are are busy for yourself and that things are kind of going great. So look, I suppose without further ado, so Barry, um, I'll hand over to yourself. I'll allow you just to introduce yourself and I give a bit of your background to yourself then, and and we'll get cracking then with your with your presentation if that's okay. Thanks, lads. Okay. Um, good evening, everybody. <clears throat> um, it's a it's an honour to be on here talking to you um, on behalf of Waterford, GA and uh, Deja Oak. Um, so as the, the title suggests, I'm going to talk to you about making every game matter. Um, just a little bit about myself first. So I'm coming to you from Clonmel, uh, County Tipperary. Um, I moved back here uh, in the summer of 2019. Um, and prior to that, for about 12 years, I was a, a Games Promotions Officer for Dublin GA. Uh, and I was in a number of clubs, you know, different backgrounds. I was in Balbriggan and I was in um, Fingal Ravens, which is a, a rural club near the airport, and then a big club in Castanac called St. Bridget's. So I um, had a great experience up in Dublin, uh, particularly coach education wise. Um, did play my hurling and, and football uh, for Fingalians and Swords. Um, but, <clears throat> you know, wanted to move home, uh, so moved back home and joined straight back with my my clubs at home, Art Finnan for the football and Belly Bacon Grange for the hurling. Um, and uh, it's been great back back with them. Um, do a bit of coaching with them and hopefully I'll be I'll be <clears throat> all going well coaching our senior footballers um, uh, very soon. Uh, I, when I moved back I with my friend myself and my friend Barry Burke who was also um, a GPO in Dublin with Kula, we started our own coaching company called Active Sports Coaching. And we teach fundamental movement skills to kids uh, in school and we run after school clubs as well. And we run evening programs for teams that that are looking for it as well. And we do it through a games based approach and um, a multi sport approach. So, yeah, we incorporate hurling and football, but we also play games like dodgeball and uh, basketball and benchball and lo loads of games like that. Um, I'm a tutor for the LGFA and Mogi Association. Um, and I'm with the GA as well. And at the beginning of lockdown, the very first one, I was lucky enough to, to start doing a bit of work for D Sports Science. 
and I've really enjoyed that. I'm, I'm the hurling coach with them, so I um, upload content on Twitter and on the website, a lot of games based stuff, write a few blogs and host a few webinars as well. <clears throat> so that that's that's pretty much me. Um, I, uh, I'm fascinated by games based coaching and I suppose that's that's what I hope to get across this evening. Of course, we're better off on the pitch doing this, but we can't do it yet. So what I'm going to do is try and make this as practical as possible um, with, with the slides, hopefully, um, that you will see some of the games that I would use and that I plan on using um, uh, in a few weeks when we're back training. So here's a, a quote that jumped out at me uh, when I read it from Richard Light. And Richard Light is a is a, a renowned academic, and I'll talk a bit about, about some of these guys during the course of the presentation. Um, Richard Light is a, an academic, he's Australian, I believe, and he said that linear coaching focuses on how to execute a skill. It doesn't teach you the why, the where, and the when. Now, our job as coaches is to combine the technical with the games, okay? Um, I'm going to talk about the performance environment through the presentation and, you know, we, we must focus on what, what is the sport that we play? You know, for us, it's hurling and football. And think about what that sport involves and are we really providing the players with the, with, with the best uh, possible coaching? Um, our job as coaches is to develop um, competency, not just proficiency. So what I mean by proficiency is, yeah, we can you strike the ball over and back? That's that's OK. That's fair enough. You could have brilliant technical skill. But are you competent? Can you take the ball on the run? Uh, can you take that pace? Can you evade a tackle and then stick it in the net or over the bar or a clearance or a pass? To me, that's competency. All right. So and that's what we want to develop in players. So. The first question I'd ask you and um, so have a read of that. And what, you know, do you have a, a philosophy? So as it says here from, from Wade Gilbert in a book called Coaching Better Every Season, an excellent book. And uh, any of you that were at, he was at, he spoke at the GEA uh, coach conference a couple of years ago. He was excellent. Um, Wade Gilbert, he said, your coaching philosophy describes how you will approach your role as a coach and how you ensure that you're staying true to your purpose and your core values. That's his coaching philosophy. OK, so. Um, and your, your coaching philosophy doesn't have to be like that. You know, it doesn't have to be a long, fancy one like Wade Gilbert's. It ha but as long as it's yours, it doesn't have to be what Liam Cahill says or what Eamon O'Shea says. OK, it's what you believe and how you're going to approach your coaching. But what you have to ensure is that you stay true to those values. My philosophy, you could probably sum it up in these three points here. So the first one there is every pass must have a thought. And that's uh, from Dennis Burkamp. Um, you know, Eddie Burkamp was an amazing footballer, but he's also an excellent coach with the IX Academy. He's really driving it over there. And, um, you know, are we content with just getting the, the players to pass over and back? Or do you have to think about it? Every pass must have a thought behind it, or you have to make a decision. Second one there, um, send and receive the ball under pressure. I believe that, you know, you have to receive the ball under a bit of pressure. That could be 3v1 or 4v1 or something. But I just I just want us to get away from the, the mind numbing stuff of over and back, over and back, man in the middle kind of stuff. And I'll show you, I'll give you a few examples in a while. Our job as coaches is to stimulate the mind, not to numb it. OK, and I think the, the really repetitive linear stuff does exactly that, numbs the mind. We want to stimulate it. And finally then, the repetition without repetition. OK, my view is that, you know, you have to ensure that making a decision on the ball is a repetitive action, that you're striking in to different people or different directions, you're looking up, but making a decision is a repetitive action. OK, if that makes sense. Um, so what kind of coach are you? And there's some great coaches there from Vera Pau to, to Klopp and Guardiola to Aim Roche to Paul Knurk, who I'll talk about in a while, um, Bielsa and um, the great man himself down the bottom left, um, Anthony Foley. So what kind of coach are you? So this is four types of coaches, and this applies now to all coaches. 
um, whether you coach the under eights or whether you're coaching the minors or the seniors. And there's four types of coach. And I got this from um, a book I read called Constraints Led Approach. And it's kind of the, maybe the science behind games-based coaching. Uh, a guy called Keith Davids. So four types. So the first one there is the safe certainty, the top um, left there. The safe certain coach is the coach that is always on autopilot. That's um, everything's rehearsed. The coach that gets complacent, that never steps out of their comfort zone. And I was, I was that coach. I think we're all, we all were, or we might be that coach at the moment. Then you go down to the underneath that bottom left, unsafe certainty. This is the coach that's controlling, that's negative, that's ultra critical. All critical all the time, where there's maybe limited participation. Okay, for, for children that might be, you know, large sided games where they're not getting a touch of the ball or lining up behind the cones, stuff like that. For maybe the minor coach or the adult coach, it could be the coach that, that tells the players what to do all the time. And they tell the players where to go, how to hit the ball, how to kick the ball, where to pass it, where to run, all those things there. The unsafe, certain, uncertain coach now is the coach that we, we definitely don't want to be. The dangerous coach, the unclear coach, the anxiety where you know you're you just don't look forward to coming down to training. You know, for young for coach of younger players, the players might be anxious about coming down, and eventually those, those players will, will not come back. Then at the top right, then the safe, uncertainty coach. This is the coach where we go. This is where we want to be. Now I, I'd never consider myself. I would never say I'm a creative coach, but what I can promise you is that I try to be creative. I try to explore, I try to challenge myself. I try and be innovative and I adapt. Um, so this is where we, where we want to be. If you, if you as coaches want to develop creativity in your players, you as a coach must be creative yourself. And I'm a big believer in that. And I think games are a great way of doing that. Okay, so why games? So players want it first and foremost. So we go down to the bottom there, player centered. Game, pl players want a games based approach. There's a guy up in at Lone IT, um, Kevin Gavin, he's doing a brilliant study, PhD study on kind of games based coaching and increasing um, physical activity. Um, and this was among teenagers. And they had, um, you know, there was lots of questionnaires and focus groups. And the research says that players want to play games. The research also shows that coaches tend to believe that um, you have to practice the technical before the game and that all most of the time the coaches are going warm up, drill, drill game training over. All right. So why games? So to develop creativity, I spoke about that. Set up problems to solve. You know, the essence of hurling football is you know, trying to outwit your opposition, trying to score more than them. That's the problem you have to solve. How do you do that? Why games? Ask, you know, asking questions. It's a great opportunity to ask questions of your players rather than telling them what to do all the time. Okay, get to play, ask the players the questions. The performance environment. So there, there's my first time mentioning that. All right. What do the players experience in a game? And player centered then. Um, as I said, players want it and it encourages reflection as well. So you can look back on your game based training and go, well, the players perform well in that, not so good in that. They really enjoyed that. OK, stuff like that. Um, if I'm going too fast, Barry, your own, just let me know and I'll, I'll slow it down. No, I'll go. Thanks, Barry. OK, so. Um, a games based approach. So Paul Canerk. He kind of divided up um, coaching into this, into training form and playing form. So a lot of coaches tend to adopt the training form, lots of drills. Um, and I'm sorry, before I go on, right, I'm not against drills or technical work, not at all. Right, I do believe that you must practice the technical, but I think game, we need to play games as well. And, and, and um, we're here to talk about games, so that, that's what I'm going to do. But I'm not against drills at all. But... The training form that Paul Knurk is talking about, and you know, Paul Knurk has coached all Ireland winning teams in Limerick and in Clare and underage in Clare as well. So he knows what he's talking about. And he's he's got um he's Dr. Paul Knurk now. 
uh, from studying game-based coaching. So the drill, the lines, unopposed, the repetition of prescriptive movements, performing skills in isolation, you know, no decisions, just, you know, passing in the triangle or, you know, the one where you, you just hit, strike the ball 10 yards and, and you follow your pass or, or you, you know, you, um, you run around the cone and hit it back. Conditioning with no ball and then you, you warm up and cool down. Playing form, however, is applied skill practices. 3v1s, you know, practicing the technical, but in a pressurized situation. You know, if you're in a 3v1 situation, three forwards, one back, you're still you're still allowing lots of time on the ball for the players to practice their hand pass and their strike, but there's a, a decision to be made. Playing form involves modified games, full-sided games, and match-based scenarios. And I will give you examples of them um, later on. But I just wanted to give you an idea of of Paul's um, research and what he, what he means by training form and playing form. So this uh, is an example of training form. So I hope you can see that. So what we have here is some really, I call them maybe old school drills for hurling and football. So the top left one there, the over back one. So just striking in straight lines. The second one there, the man in the middle, where five would strike to six and six would give it back to five six will turn around and take it off seven uh, and give it back and then you have the triangle where you know right lads you have to go clockwise strike the ball clockwise and then you have the, the square you know past 13 will pass to 11 11 to 12 and so on and um, then there might be a variation where 13 will pass to 11 and 13 has to sprint around the square to get back to where he was um to receive the ball okay so and to me you know, if, if I was, if, if this was a, um, like if we if we were doing this face to face in the pitch, I'd be asking you, what do you notice about this? Okay, so there's no decisions here. The coach is telling the players what to do all the time. He's telling them how to pass it, where to pass it, and where to run uh, with the ball and where to run after the ball. The coach is making every single decision here. And how does that play, prepare the players for the performance environment? Okay, I'm going to play a little video again of, of one of them and ask yourself the question, right? Where is the decision making here? I hope this works now. So um, imagine that they're not soccer players and uh, they're kicking around their hands. So where are the decisions here? All right, there is none. You know, you're telling the players where to go, how to kick it, or how to strike it, uh, and where to run after the ball. But why do we persist with these? All right, a lot of coaches believe that technique needs to be mastered before gameplay. Um, you know, a lot of coaches, especially in the early season, they, this is the kind of stuff they do, the linear stuff, and the running without the ball. I believe that there's a fear among coaches, that there's a, per a perceived loss of control. So if all the players aren't lined up behind the, the cones and they're not running in straight lines, um, that the coach has control. Whereas if you're playing lots of games, there's a perceived loss of control. It's how they were coached. You see a lot of coaches coaching teams the way they were in their day. All right. And we need to, you know, you are you are not the coach that coached you, if you, if you know what I mean, right? The fella or the, the the woman that coached you when you were fourteen or fifteen, right? You're not that coach. You have to be your own coach, okay? So a typical session um, involves the warm up, do some drills, do a few more drills, a match, and a warm down. So the question I'd ask you: Does it always have to be this way? Do you always have to finish with the match? I believe you do. Do you always have to start with the drills? Absolutely not. I always start training, I have warm up, and the, and the ball is in the warm up for every single bit of it. Then I'd always start with a game. And it's a great way to set the tone for your session. So if you have, if you're lucky enough to have big numbers, so if I've got, let's say I had 28 down training, I'd have two seven-a-side matches full on 
Then I might go into maybe some tactical work or a technical exercise. And I'll show you an example of a, of a I would call a game based technical exercise. And then I go into another game and then I play a full side of game at the end. Right. If any of if any of you ever logged on to any of Martin Fogarty's webinars over the past year, he'll tell you how important it is to play the match. And he's dead right. It's important to play the full side game as well if you have those numbers. All right. Because that's what you're going to be playing on, on the Saturday or Sunday. But it's also important to have different types of games as well. Tactical games, small side games, um, and obviously the technical stuff as well. So playing form. Right. What are we trying to coach? So I'm going to play a video. Hopefully it plays. I'll play it a few times. It is not water now. Barry, did that play okay? Yeah, it was a little bit jumpy, Barry, but you could see you could see it pretty clearly as to yeah. like what players were on the ball, what matches it was, and, and, and what, what what you were kind of looking for there. Okay. I'm going to play it again, and, I, and I'll talk people through it. Anyway, I, I had planned to do this anyway. So, what we're trying to coach, you know, we want to coach players to, to pick it up on the run, short grip, great goal by Desi Hutchinson there, um, the, the, the short grip finish, scoring under pressure. Same with Aussie there, short grip, okay, striking on the run. We're trying to coach players to look up, make a decision. I couldn't let that pass go without showing the goal, obviously. This one here, you know, work rate. So I pause it there. So I'm showing this one here. Because if you can look up, if you can see at the score, right, doubling our point down, uh, there are um about four just over four minutes left and there are five in rows on the line okay and the work rate of the dublin here was unbelievable and they were hunting in packs and they, they forced you know they, they forced carry they forced turnovers got their score to draw it and they nearly won it in the end and it was sheer work rate the tackling and they and you know that you don't just flick a switch and turn that something like that on you practice that they practice it through games games based coaching and I'll show you a game later on for hunting and packs. Monty Murphy here, you know, winning the ball under pressure, scoring under pressure, okay, lots of decisions. Outside of the boot finish like that, a brilliant goal. Again, scoring under pressure. How many times have you seen drills where you run into the 21 and score with no pressure on? Scoring on the run. Winning the ball, 
we all love to do this, but look the way Paul Maher looks up and gives the pass. The days of just launching our defence are gone, lads, as we all know that. Scoring under pressure. Okay. Performing the skills, receiving the ball on the run. The short grip goal. Running on the ball, running off the ball, support play, kicking it on the run. Watch the run by Donahue, off his man. All this stuff is practice and training. Game scenarios. Okay. The skills we need, this is why we use games. So sending and receiving, maintaining possession, performing skills at pace, maintaining possession while scanning the pitch. So remember Parag Maher's uh, past year where he, great catch, he looked up and gave a lovely stick pass out the wing. The ball into Patrick, you know, for Patrick Hargo's goal against Kilkenny, the short grip one, the, the ball in was, was exceptional. Striking at an angle to a player on the move and then receiving the possession and gaining possession on the run. Okay, that's why we, we, we use games. So why do we use playing form? Okay, so this is a quote, the techniques, skills, tactics and strategies that players use in these systems can be considered as probabilities but can't be predetermined by a coach. Right? What does that mean? That's a mouthful. Basically, you can't write a script for the game of hurling and football. They're so unpredictable. So why would we set up training to be predictable all the time? where the coach makes every decision, tells you where to, where to run, where to strike, and what to do for the, the 60 or 70 minutes that you're, that you're training, okay? So this is the match environment matrix by Dave Allred in a book called The Pressure Principle, a brilliant book, and I'd recommend it to, to for any coach to read, The Pressure Principle. And he came up with this match environment matrix. So have a look at it. So where does hurling and football appear on this. Okay, so is it ordered or chaotic? We take hurling, right? Um, hurling is chaotic. It's, it's uh, unpredictable. It's physically stressful, not physically comfortable. It's a very aggressive sport with loads of physical contact. So if you were to run, move your finger along the line or you were to highlight the, the line in between ordered and chaotic, you'd be, you'd be kind of be bring it right down to chaotic, because that's what hurling and football are. So chaotic, unpredictable, physically stressful, aggressive, with loads of physical contact. So I'm gonna go back here. So why would we set up training to that's, phys that's, that's physically comfortable? Okay, that is with no physical contact. Have a look at that. You know, what's going on here? Those drills were were passive. They were physically comfortable, no contact, very predictable, as in the coach was telling you what to do all the time. And it was very ordered, okay, army-like. Okay, that's golf, guys. Golf is ordered, predictable. Uh, well, unlike, well if, if I'm playing golf, it's unpredictable because I'm awful at it. Um, it's physically comfortable. It does, there's no one trying to block you down when you're when you're teeing off. It's passive, uh, and there's no physical contact. But that's what those drills I showed you earlier on were. We have to create scenarios where it's all of these things on the right hand side. That's our job as coaches. Our job as coaches is to prepare the players for the performance environment. Okay. Failure to deliver training and preparation in the match environment will often result in a reduced ability to perform under pressure in match conditions. Okay, so your job as a coach, our job as coaches is to match the training conditions to the conditions that the players will, will experience in the game, in the match they play at the weekend. And if, we're don't, if we're not preparing the players for the performance environment, if we're not preparing the players for the sport that they play, we're failing our players. All right, so 
we move on to you know so the game what kind of games so your games need to be purposeful okay they need to have a tactical a technical and a physical element okay so first thing to do identify the problem you know whether it is it performance skills under pressure uh is there an issue with long striking is there an issue with just simple passing the environment then too um you know what's the environment so goals equipment balls you need more balls players okay do you need to divide up into into four four teams rather than two so think of the, the stepper model in uh, in, in coach education you know the space time equipment equipment personnel and rules all right other coaches is a big part of this so if you're the manager make sure you've got help there so if you do a 7v7 at one end of the pitch make sure you have another coach that can do the same the exact same game but at the other end of the pitch because we want to maximize the, the amount of time the players are on the ball as well three then the constraints and what I mean, what we mean by that is kind of the size of the pitch. So do you need to make it bigger so you'd encourage maybe longer kick passing? Or is it smaller because you want more physical contact? Do you put in a rule like you can, you can only have three seconds on the ball so to, maxim, to, to improve the decision making? Or do you have to make three passes before you, you deliver a longer pass? Okay. Is there a, a non-contact area? And I, I will talk about non-contact stuff um, towards the end as well, because I am aware that we, we may have to do non-contact stuff for a little while. But uh, could you have a non-contact area where, you know, you could have an area of the pitch where if, if a certain player gets the ball, they can't be touched until they release it into the, the contact area, or stuff like that. The design of your game, you know, is it going to be log, large side, is it going to be a large pitch, a small side of game, a wide side of game? The game principles, all right, so it could be, the rule could be, um, the principle could be, right, we're going to, we're going to take advantage of the, the, the mark, the offensive mark. So the principle might be, of the session or the goal might be long kicking. Okay, and then the assessment, and this is maybe one we forget or we choose to ignore. Well, assess the game's effectiveness using data when i mean data i don't mean getting more gps i mean having somebody there to, just to record maybe how many hooks and blocks or turnovers all right because if you don't if you're not assessing the game and it's effectiveness then you're you're kind of you're i would say it, you're kind of you're lying to yourself you're kind of making it up okay yeah i think that's good yeah but it might be but if you can prove that okay they're getting lots of tackles in lots of turnovers lots of blocks then you can, this is a good game. I'm trying to improve this. This is a good kind of acronym for designing your session, all right? The GROW one. So the G is the goal. So what's the goal? What's the short-term goal and the long-term goal? So let's use the example I used a second ago about long kicking and the offensive mark. Okay, as football coaches, you decide, right, we're going to take advantage of this. It could get us three or four easy points in a game. All right, that could be the short, the long term. The short term might be to improve our long kick passing. To, so, because if you can't kick long accurately, well, then the offensive mark isn't going to work. What's the focus for learning or the attention of the session? You know, is it combining your work rate, winning the ball back, hunting in packs, combining it with with long kicking? The R then is the reality. You want to do a games-based session, but can the players do it? Is the reality of the situation is the current the players are not skillful enough or don't have the required devil to play lots of games? Or on the flip side, a game is a great way to to expose or to find out the reality of the situation. You might see from playing small-sided games where players would have to do maybe more kicking than in a normal game. You might find out that, geez, these lads are not good at kicking. Or these guys tackling, these guys are giving away freeze all the time. You might find that out from a game. The O then is the, the options. You know, what activities? You know, am I going to use the, am I going to adopt a games based approach, which as I mentioned earlier on, players want it. And we all want to be player centered. And trust me, that's pl players want games. What am I using what am I going to use the games for? Is it um 
but for fitness. How do you measure performance? I spoke about assessment earlier on about the effectiveness uh, of the game. How do you know you've been successful? The way forward. All right. How do you prepare for the practice environment? And reflection in action and on action. OK. And I will discuss reflection in action and on action uh, before the end. So the types of games that we play. So. Um, at the start, I said I'm going to try and make this as practical as possible for you, for you guys. All right. It, obviously, it'd be better on the pitch and we could watch we could watch the games being played. But um, I'll try and make this as practical as, po as possible. So possession games, large, large side of games or small side of games. Match based. So setting up um, match based scenarios are really important. A full game is important if you have that those numbers. Right, types of games. A game based approach doesn't mean that you have um, two goals that you score goals and points. You could have four goals, you could have six goals, you could have zones, an end zone, you could have gates to run through to, to get a score. You might have to run through a gate before you deliver a pass to score into the goal. All right, there's loads of opportunities to use a game based approach. So, uh, Barry, can you see that okay now? That, that diagram. Yeah, Barry, we can. Yeah, in full screen, okay. it looks it looks pretty clear. Like, yeah. Great. So this is a match based scenario. Okay, and what happens is that um, you can see the the red circles. That's where the balls are. So this is um, a good alternative to backs and forwards. I hate the old backs and forwards. The one I was exposed to as a player, and I'd say a lot of you were too, where the coach would stand in the middle, and he'd hit the ball in. So the you can see the way it's set up there, six back, six forwards. OK, and let's just say the coach kicked it into the or struck it into the to the corner forward. He got the ball and he stuck it over the bar and he goes back to his corner, delighted for himself. He knows that he was he's not going to get a ball for at least two or three minutes and he can relax. Because he knows someone else is going to get it. And that's not that's not what happens in a game. Right, as I said, hurling, remember, hurling is probably the most unpredictable team sport in the world. It's certainly the most chaotic. So what I would do is I would just say, right, pick a pick a wing, pick a side, and you have to start the game from one of the red circles. So the back might have to start from the corner from the corner back, and he has to work it out through the red poles. So you can see with, with the the yellow box and the two red arrows pointing to the red gates. The backs have to strike it through them to get a score, because it's important that the backs get to score too, and the forwards obviously have to score goals and points. OK, or the forward will start the game. The forward, the midfielder might start from the middle or the corner forward might start from the corner and he has to make at least one pass before a score. Or the wing forward might have to pick it up on the run, look up and deliver long. All right, and it becomes unpredictable and that's what you want. I used to always hate as a, as a player when the coach would go, right, all the backs become forwards now because the coach felt that should the backs start enjoying this, they have, to have, to have, a, have an opportunity to score. All right. Whereas in this scenario, the backs do have the opportunity to score by delivering long out the wings, because that's what they're going to be doing in a game. A corner back or a wing, a wing back ain't going to be getting the ball in the 45 turning and knocking over the bar. It's a forwards job. OK. This is another match based scenario similar to the last one, but as you can see there, if you can see the yellow arrows that I would have kind of a sweeper there. So again, we'd start off whatever way you want to start it off. You get the midfielders or the, the wing forwards to run out, start the game with a pickup and deliver long. If the backs win it, their job is to deliver it long through one of the red poles. However, you have the sweeper there at the other end of the pitch running over and back, trying to intercept the pass, just like a game. And the rule is if that sweeper picks the ball up before it gets to the red gates, he can, or she can start the attack straight away just like it would in a game. So the idea is to void the sweeper. Now, whether you agree with it or not, it is part of the game. And if you don't agree with it and you don't play a sweeper, well, you're going to be coming up against it because lots of teams do use it. OK, so what we're doing here is preparing players for the performance environment. Possession games. This is a long sided one. So the game is played between the 45s. It's full on. And the way you score is 
the green players have to strike the ball long to their to their green player between one of the red gates and when they do that um they swap positions so everybody you know in theory gets a goal between the red gates and it's just gets players looking up and striking it to the wings you know rather than just just having a, a possession game between the 45s okay that's that's for long sided games this is one of my favorite small sided games um i think someone might have asked a question um when you were signing up to this about off the shoulder running or running off the ball or tracking runs and um, this is a great game for it so think of american football the way you score is the blue team have to catch the ball inside the end zone the blue end zone here if they do catch the ball cleanly um they get a score they put it down and then the red the red start and they try and walk the ball up to their end zone um, the ball must be caught while you're running in. You can't just have someone camped in, in the end zone all the time. You know, you'll find if you do with children, they'll do that. But um, with adults or, or, you know, teenagers, you've got to emphasize that you have to be, receive the ball on the run. OK, and it's a great way to, to, you know, once you get a score, you drop the ball, the Reds can just restart immediately. So there's a transition there and it's running up and down. So the defending team are tracking the runs because the way you get the score is by running in to the end zone and catching it. And that, 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 that's a small side of game. This was kind of a, a large side of game. And this is a small side of game. This is, uh, I would describe as a non-contact drill, but there's, there's, um, there's pressure on. So what happens is, so the player with the ball in the yellow bib, if you can see it, has to give it to one of the three um, blue and yellow players here um, and each yellow player blue and yellow player must get a pass of the ball so it's 3v2 or you can do a 4v2 whatever you want but when each player gets a ball gets a pass they must kick the ball or strike the ball through one of the red poles so you're you're affording the blue team loads of opportunities to get their hands on the ball and make a pass with the ultimate goal of striking it diagonally through the pole and for me, this is a much better way of, of practicing striking or kicking than kicking over and back or doing the man in the middle where the coach is making every decision for you. So, and then what you could do is you can add in, you can see the, the two black arrows, this player can be running over and back trying to intercept the pass. Okay, and when the ball is struck, then, you know, one, can st one of these, the blue players can step out and the three, the three, uh, um, red players can do the attacking. You know, there's loads of progressions here for it, but the theory behind it is that you're doing a bit of work under pressure and you're looking up, making a decision, but you're getting lots of opportunities to practice the skills as well. This is another non-contract one. So it starts with the um, the ball, the player on the sideline. Then there's two players on the other side of the blue cone, the yellow bay player with his back to the ball and the player in front of him must be running over and back trying to receive the ball so you strike and as soon as the ball is struck then the yellow player tries to get it back off him but he's he's reacting to the to the player who's going to receive the ball and he kicks it back here and you go again and you swap around and the idea is that again there's the decisions to be made there's a bit, little bit of pressure um and there is you can do with short passing or long passing Okay, you can do long kick passing or, or striking. And again, I, this, this would be my idea of a drill. Okay, the unopposed linear stuff, I've gone completely away from it. The fitness and the work rate. Someone was mentioned there about, um, about tackling and giving away freeze all the time. How do you coach it? Well, you have to practice it first of all. So what I'd suggest is starting off with a small side of game, um, with lots of tackling, then stop it. Let's practice practice the tackling in maybe two v one situations or one on one even, and then go back to the game. So I call this game um, hunting packs. So what happens is that it's uh, six v six, but it's just two groups of three. So you can see that the white team there, they're very close together. They have to stay in that group of three for the whole game. All right, hunting in packs. Remember the video, the, the, the video of the dubs who were hunted in packs trying to win the ball back. And, and the blue team have to keep possession. 
and the, and the yellow team are trying to dispossess it, but they must stay in their groups of three. And if they do turn it over, well then the white team spread out and keep the ball, and the blue team must hunt in packs by getting into twos or threes, whatever you want. Very tiring game, but it's great for work rate. It's great for hurling and for football. Nearly there, so, but be careful. So, I have three pitchers there. So one is a boxer. So if you can imagine that boxer, who if he was standing that close to the to the bag, like that, punching, right? His uppercuts would, would be great. He'd be good at the body shots. But if that's all he did, well, his jabs would suffer and his defense of, of, um, of long punches would suffer. If you look at the, the cricketer, if all he did was practice um, batting from a machine, well, he might become brilliant at it, no matter how fast the ball from the machine is. What happens when he faces a human being with maybe an, or an unorthodox bowling action? OK, you know, he's going to be confused. And the same with um, small sided games. If all you do is the small sided stuff, well, then you're risking injury. You are risking, you are not working on the other elements of the game, like long passing. OK, so be careful that they call that the, the metastable region, you know, where, you know, you're only kind of focusing really on one thing. Um, don't ignore the technical. OK, so games are brilliant, but you must remember the technical aspects of the game. And that's why I would use stuff like this. That This is technical practice, but you're preparing players for performance environment. And then develop competence, like I said at the start. Multiple skills, being able to receive the ball in the run, okay, looking up and laying the ball off or sticking over the bar, as opposed to the isolated skill where it's just, yeah, they might look great hitting the ball over and back, but can they receive it under a bit of pressure? Can they turn and stick it over the bar? Just a few tips for your coaching going forward. Um, use cones as boundaries, not players. So what I mean by that is, you know, uh, try and get away from the running around the cones and performing a skill um, and give it a back. Okay, just use the cone as a boundary for a pitch. Don't use them as players, if that makes sense. This is a great saying I got from Wexford GA. I was on a webinar there they gave on games-based coaching. It's on YouTube, I think. Well worth a look. Excellent one. I think it was Shane O'Hanlon down there. He said it. But perform in a storm. I think it's a great way to sum up a games-based approach. To be able to perform under pressure Performing the performance environment, performing a storm. Um, players want games. Be creative. My favourite part of coaching now is trying out new things, planning out my session, coming up with a new game, a new exercise, and then seeing if it works. It doesn't work all the time, right? Accept that you're going to, not everything will work, that you'll fail, but, but learn from it. Try and make the game better. Have your plan with you so if it's not working you can change it and reflect so reflective practice is really important uh, in any kind of coaching okay so reflect and i mentioned earlier on um reflection in action and on action so inaction is where you um decide okay this is not working i have to change it um or a player is not doing what they're supposed to be doing you need to need to have a, have a chat with them um you need buy-in for games-based coaching and maybe a player is just slacking off because if one player slacks off from it then he's kind of given a false sense he or she is given a false sense of performance to the player they might be marking who thinks they're having a great game but reality is that the person they're marking isn't putting it in so that's reflection on action and then our reflection in action sorry reflection on action then is after it with your coaching group just having a chat about training going how did that go what did we do well and that's really important to reflect on that as well. What did we do well? Okay, for yourself. When we think of critical analysis, we always think the bad stuff. But a critical analysis means that you're looking at what went well also. And that's important for you as coaches because if you plan your session, there'll be loads of things you did well. But also look back on the stuff that maybe didn't go so well and maybe try and understand why it didn't go so well. And more importantly, right, what do you do the next time that situation arises? And then a shameless plug for me before I finish. Um, I designed a games-based book uh, recently 
it's for hurling, but it can be it, it's you can use them all for football as well. If there's any football coaches there, go on to Daily Sports Science there and download the book. Um, it's only a tenner. Um, I believe it's well worth it. I had I got good feedback from it. Um, if you have any questions, that's my email address, barrymillan at gmail.com. And if you want to follow me on Twitter, I put up stuff every, stuff every week for coaches to just to, to have a look and try things out. So um, that's it for me. Thanks for listening. I hope you learned something from it. Um, and Shane. Brilliant stuff, Barry. Uh, a point uh, of taken from there. I've, I've the hand nearly worn off myself now taking notes, to be honest. Um, I suppose just to kind of go back over kind of the main stuff that you would have covered on that there. Like uh, notes I've made here, like about obviously every pass must have a thought. Uh, send and receive the ball under pressure. Repetition, repetition, repetition. Making a decision is a repetitive action. And then just your the what you were talking about in regard to um, I suppose creating a performance environment and having a player centred approach then to um, to your coaching. And then I thought the practical examples that you actually gave uh, for coaches were really, really good. Like just like it's not that they weren't terribly complex, but like they were, you know, they were brilliant in their simplicity nearly that any coach would be able to take those and probably be able to implement them in your sessions, you would like to think. Um, and that there's, I suppose, underneath it all then as well there's a, a hidden layer of stuff kind of going on in every in every um activity that you had and that's that's the essence of good coaching i suppose is is um layering lots of different stuff down um uh, in a particular activity um, and then just kind of the, the last few ones then that what you were talking about, about accepting failure changing and self-reflection then as well like i think that's absolutely critical um i suppose maybe some coaches maybe some lesser experienced coaches possibly can be a little bit uh, too hard on themselves sometimes. Whereas I think over time, as you kind of get more confident in your own ability, you kind of start to figure out what works for you as a coach. Um, but definitely that aspect of um, of reflection and that aspect of, of of thinking about what you do is critical. But um, look, overall, it was fantastic. I, I just took so much out of that and I hope every, everybody watching t took a lot out of it as well. Um, I'll hand you over to Owen there shortly, Owen Bernock, just who has a few questions for you. But um, just before I do, I just have one question that popped into my head myself uh, while, while, you're, while you were doing your presentation. And that would be like, like where did you get your passion for game-based coaching, Barry? Like, was it kind of something that you got for kind of from your playing career? Or was it something that kind of came from the academic side of things? Um, both, Barry. So I am... Um... I was always kind of a frustrated player in that I knew as a player that some of the stuff we were doing wasn't right and it wasn't reflective of the game. I, I, maybe I didn't understand why and I didn't want to say it and um, I didn't want to rock the boat or anything like that. Or maybe I couldn't articulate it, I'm not sure. Um, then I did a master's in sports coaching over in the UK and kind of opened my eyes to, to the reflective part but challenging yourself and thinking outside the box. And that's when I kind of got really fascinated by games-based coaching, talking to other other coaches. And um, my class in college was half of us were either, well, I was the only GA coach. There was swimming, professional football, um, fencing, and then the other half were all golf pros. And, you know, they do a lot of thinking outside the box because you think golf coaching is just get out in the course, I'll go to the range and practice. There's so much more to it. And that kind of opened my eyes to their preparation. And then I noticed a long-winded answer. Um, when I was working in Dublin then, I was um, the coach education I got up there was was outstanding. Um, you know, for the stuff that Jerry Connor organised for us. But I was always a little frustrated that it was always football because it was easy. You know, and I suppose when you think about it, you can't do much games-based stuff. Uh, with coaches that lettering each other with no helmets and stuff like that. So we have to use football. I appreciate that now. But rather than waiting for you know people like that to hand it to me, I said I'd do my own research. And that's when I kind of started the, the Twitter thing about putting a game up every week. Because I, I was learning. You know, I, I was the one that was trying to, to come up with games-based approaches. And then I started reading more and more about it and uh, got to a stage where I became fascinated by it. And... Um, 
and now it's like when I train, the ratio is I play three games and maybe one drill in a in a training session. That's the way it's gone. Look, that could change. I might go back the other way, but for the moment, that, that that's why I'm, I'm fascinated by it. But I do believe I, I'm a big believer in it. Yeah. Yeah. No, it, it's funny. Like even watching watching your presentation and listening to you talk. Like I remember, kind of think I was just thinking to myself, kind of saying, "I was like, God, I'd actually love to have a coach like that." It's not that I haven't had coaches like that myself, but it's just more a case of I'd love to play for a coach like that that puts such an emphasis on games based coaching because I know it's probably it can be physically tougher on the player, but it's probably a lot more enjoyable because you're challenged, you're you're make decisions, you've to you've a lot to kind of think on. So it's um. It's it's a uh, it's great to have a coach that's so passionate about it and that is kind of sharing that day and kind of you can really start to see people coming around to it there over the last while. So so it's brilliant. Yeah. So I suppose keep on keeping on, you know. And um, just the thing on that part, you know, I was like I was saying, I was kind of the frustrated player. We were a, t- a hurling team in Dublin where we, look, we were decent, but we, we rarely had you know twenty eight to thirty at training. And our football weeks, we might have fourteen or fifteen. So we always played backs and forwards, and I hated it because I knew it was wrong. But the coach was kind of, you know, so what else can I do? And we used to have a rule where, you know, you couldn't go inside. A shooting drill was just linear. And you couldn't go inside the 21 because to give the keeper a chance. And I'm going, sure. I'm not going to play the game. I'm not going tw- inside the 21. That used to frustrate me. And I just promised myself because later on, I started coaching a team in my club, in Fingalians. And all I did was play games with the boys, and they loved it. These were fifteen-year-olds; they just couldn't get enough of it. And because um, I, I, I made the effort to to plan it. You know, like I said, there I don't claim to be really creative, but I try and be creative. And I think that's the key: is to try and be creative. And you, and I promise all the coaches listening, if you try and be creative, you'll enjoy coaching so much more. Yeah, it's funny, like any time I see some of the stuff that you put up, like, you know, there's a part of me in my own head kind of really saying to myself, like, if I was 10 years at it, I wouldn't be able to come up with some of the stuff that you come up with. But um, it's a learning curve, too, I suppose, that you just have to kind of work at something like that and that you probably get better at over time. But um, yeah, definitely. And, I, yeah. I, I, and, and Barry, I don't like sit down and come up with these from scratch as well. Some of them I do. And I like doing that. But I get them from other sports. I, I follow soccer guys on Twitter or basketball or hockey and I go geez I could use that and I kind of adapt it or Gaelic football you know Colin Nally's book is great um, yeah. you know I've, I've no problem saying that I, I I steal loads of stuff I think what the Raj Ronagar say he's a copy and paste coach where he just takes what he needs <laughs> and and yeah. applies to his coach that's what I do it's, I'd be a copy and paste coach completely but sure that's me trying to be creative so yeah, yeah. It's funny you mentioned it actually about kind of taking inspiration from 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 other uh, sports and that. I remember, uh, I'd say when I was probably in my late teens, early 20s, our own club coach at home, uh, Timmy O'Keefe, who'd be well known to a lot of people in Waterford now, a former county secretary and, um, um, uh, you know, a brilliant coach. Like, But there was a season where he had a load of new activities and a load of new drills where I go, geez, this is brilliant. Like it was totally innovative and a lot different to stuff that we had done before. So I just asked him, I said, like, where like, you have a load of new activities? And he said, he said, I found this book and he said, I got somebody to send it on to me. He said a photocopy of it. He said, because uh, I couldn't, I couldn't get a copy myself. It was a photocopy of an Australian basketball coach. And bear in mind now, this was in the late eight, kind of, well, it was probably like the mid mid nineties. It was kind of a little bit early on, but, he just had pages and pages of basketball um, basketball activities that he was after modifying for Gaelic games. And they just worked so well. Like, you just had to do a couple of little tweaks. But it's just funny the way you can actually use other sports, um, use their activities or whatever to your own advantage at times. So I just thought that was kind of really quirky, you know. Um, so, look, we'll... Um, I'll call on Owen there. So Owen has a couple of questions there for you, um, Barry, um, that have come in on the chat and, that, and ones that have come in in advance. So we'll just go through those if that's okay. So you can shoot ahead there, so Owen. Um, thanks, Barry and Barry. Yeah, and um, thanks for that presentation. A couple of questions, as, as you know, we, we got a few earlier on that we, we, we shared there. Um, one, I suppose, maybe to tell you what, what you were just chatting there, there a few minutes about work rate. Do you find it hard to keep players engaged at that high intensity work rate, Barry? If you're if you're doing all games, um, is, is it harder to keep them? And how do you get that balance right between having 
the games based activities all the time, but making sure that at the end of this end of this um yeah, the session that they're still at that intensity, like what you showed in the Dublin and Kerry or Kerry clip earlier on. Is, is that a hard thing to work on or how do you get that balance? Um well it's important that I mean if you want to work if you want to try and develop work rate, at the end of the day, like work rate is a choice that a player has to make once they cross the white line. They are going to work hard or not. But you can, I think you can condition players or help them to, to have better work rate by playing those games, the small side of ones. But to answer your question, Owen, I mean, you have to combine the small side of stuff with maybe the longer side of stuff where you're, um, you're playing a full game. Or if you remember the game I played where I showed where it's um, play between the 45s, where there's lots of long striking, stuff like that. And then combine that with tactical work setting up a backs and forwards, scenario, a realistic scenario for backs and forwards. And then you have to put in your your technical work as well. So, I mean, yeah, if you're doing the small sided games for the for the hour, I mean, that, that's not sustainable, you know? So um, you have to mix it up. All, what I'd say to coaches is like, what does the sport involve? If you're coaching hurling, what's involved in hurling? Just, you know, just, just short passing, long passing, running off the ball, tackling, you know, and if you can make your game, games like, you know, to, to mirror those things, I think it, it, it'd be just fine. But yeah, the, the small side of stuff is great for the tackling and stuff like that and the work rate, but, you know, you have to mix it up a bit with, with different games. Lovely. Thanks. Um, one that came in b beforehand and another one that kind of came in during the presentation that are, are slightly related, and you touched on, on the one beforehand about how to maintain the discipline and stop players fouling and, and maintaining composure. And then another one that, that goes with that, and you spoke about Dave Aldridge's model with the having the, the chaos and that. So mm. how do you maintain that discipline and uh, stop the, the kind of keep players composed, doing the right thing, making the decision making, etc., and have some bit of control over the chaos that you're, we're, we're trying to create a chaotic situation or still maintain a level of control of it as a coach over over what our aims for the session are and the outcomes we're looking to get at. So if, if you might be able to tackle that one. Um, can you repeat the question? No, no, I'm only joking. How do we... Um, um, like, you have to... Like, the... Like maintaining the, the the tackling part, right? You have to practice it, but you can't really you can't practice tackling without opposition. So break down the skill. All right. So I'd always say, um, you know, tackling involves reacting with your your feet. Players tend to react with their hands too much, and that's what gives away to fouls. So react with your feet and practice that. Focus on the ball, hand in low hands, hand in quick, react with the feet, and they have to practice that. So I'd always maybe start with a game, small side of game, then go back, practice the tackling technique and go back to it again. You know, it's, it's practice, you know. For the, the chaos part, one of the, the draw, the perceived drawbacks of games-based coaching is the perceived loss of control. I wouldn't be able to control that. But if your games have clear, you know, a couple of rules that you, do, you know, the players understand it. But for me, games are great because everybody's engaged. You know, um, particularly with older players, with, with really small kids, you know, you, your focus has to be maybe getting them a ball each and you're practicing the, the, the bouncer or solo or the pickup plus games. But the older they get, I think uh, it becomes easier. But the coaches don't do use a games based approach because they think they're going to lose control. But you're not. If your games are clearly defined, the rules are defined, check for understanding and let them off. All right. Um, but you need help as well from other coaches. Like I said, I, kind of, I said at the start, you know, if you've got big numbers, divide it in two. So, Owen, you go down there and you do the end zone game with 14 players. And Barry, you, you go to the other end and do the same game like that. And you can swap the teams around and stuff like that. All right. Lovely. Um, I suppose another one, you, you, you kind of almost, you alluded to this about the different age groups and that. And we got a question in here about, um, how old should players be before we start using the games-based coaching uh, model as, as the model for training? And you touched there that you know it's easier with some of the older players, but can we do stuff in our activities, even if it's on the non-contact variety or that, with 
you know, with the smaller ages, even with your your eights and tens, um, getting them into the into the idea of what games based coaching and the activities that we put in place. And, and would you would you advocate and do you use that approach when I know like Barry and our GDAs you to be in school doing some coaching. So do you use that method with, with your third and four classes that you're in school with as well? Absolutely. You know, and it, they don't have to be hurling and football games. You can play dodgeball, you can play basketball, you can play bench ball, you know, chasing games for for younger than that. You know, they, you think you think of tag games. Um, you know, I think do you remember Owen when I came down and I did the cool camp training for coaches? Yeah, I think yeah. Those tag games are still on YouTube. Yeah, yeah, I was going to reference that video before we finished, yeah. Tag games are, have the, you know, think of the principles of hurling and football, evasion, decision making, looking up. Um, Tag games have all that uh, defending, you know, occupying space, um, you know, decisions like, will I go tag my friend or will I go and save my friend who's stuck or will I save myself? You know, stuff like that. Tag games are brilliant. That's a games-based approach. A games-based approach isn't, Two goals and scoring goals and points. You know, you could have the that end zone game that I showed you that I would play with with senior teams. You know, but I play that with kids as well. I'd play non-contact um, American football. You know, with a small American footballer or a softball, and they're just throwing the ball around and to throw it into the end zone. Or you can do for hurling dribbling. They just dribble the ball into the end zone. You know, stuff like that. Again, I use a games-based approach for. Um, as soon as they come in the gate, and what I mean is, you know, if they're five, right up to, to adults. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But I do think, I do think, though, on that, especially with the younger kids, if there's any coaches of younger kids there, that really it's about the ball first. Get them on the ball as much as possible. Play in a, play a few games like tag games or a kind of a condition game, and then um, ball work as well. But get them on the ball. That they're there to play ball, not to wait around for a ball. Yeah. I think that that point you make about it doesn't have to be goals with or I get, I get to have games based doesn't have to be goals that it, it can be it's an activity that replicates something that happens in the match so the tag and mm-hmm. the chasing replicates something happened in the match even the, even tagging into someone to get that near hand tackle you know it's, it's, it's replicating what happens in the match it's the should i stay or should i go the decision making that you spoke about earlier on when you when you referenced the philosophies on that and um, so thanks for that that's that's really good and i was i was going to reference that that work you did with us um, last year you came down you did some stuff with our, our uh, cool camp coaches so really good session just on games and different type of activities that our cool camp coaches could could look at and it's up on our day show youtube page and certainly along with tonight's stuff you know some of the stuff that you spoke about there tonight is the actual physical version of it is 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 on the video so people can see that those games if you want to have a look at it um in your own time Two more questions, Barry. I know we're, we're pushing towards quarter past eight, so we'll, we'll get to these two questions. <clears throat> you spoke about excess, uh, assessing uh, the games at the end, and, and, and you spoke about it earlier on, and then you, you spoke a little bit more about your reflective practice at, at the end of the, the, the session. What are, you, what are you looking to assess, or, or can you give maybe people a couple, of, you spoke a little bit about how many blockdowns or turnovers. Is, is there simple stuff that a coach could do even if they only have their, their notebook or their clipboard with you know with a sheet of paper, rather than going into the, the high tech stuff, what kind of tips can you give coaches that they're they're maybe a little bit more than on, on elaborate more on what you spoke about earlier for assessing is the game functional and is it getting the outcomes that you plan to get for it at, at start your session? Yeah, so what you said there about the you know the the stats, the turnovers and the the passes and who's getting on the ball, but what you can do as well. Look, video it, you know, and I'm not talking about getting, you know, Damien Young down with, with his equipment. I'm talking about get someone on their iPad or iPhone, get up in the stand and video the session uh, or, or a game and see how that goes, right? If they're, if obviously, if they're teenage or children, you need uh, consent. But, um, you know, if, certainly if you're coaching over 18s, yeah, video it. You can see how you're performing as a coach as well. Video is an excellent tool for reflection because it's honest reflection. And it's not it's not reflection from from memory, you know that oh I think that went well. Whereas look, the video doesn't lie. The second thing I do is uh, what I've done: give your players a questionnaire, ask them what do you enjoy about this, what don't you enjoy about it. Is there anything that we could be covering or that we're working on that um, that we haven't worked on that you want to see worked on? You know I I did that with the last team I coached. Um, 
properly you know, in Dublin, we had a questionnaire maybe a couple of months in and got lots of feedback. You know, one of the one of the things was that maybe some players tend to hide in games, whereas you know if they were running in straight lines, you could see who's last, you know, or something like that. But I mean, that doesn't bother me. It bothers me that players are hiding all right. So maybe the video will show. Maybe something could sit down with the player then and show them. Listen, you're not trying as hard as you can, or you know stuff like that. But the questionnaire, it'll tell you a lot. You know, have it anonymous so you don't the players don't have to put their name on it. And just basically. Do you enjoy this? What do you enjoy about it? And what would you like to see done more of? So excellent. Yeah, that, that that that's really good. I suppose that that's for the development, that buy-in that you spoke about earlier, getting that buy-in from the players and, and getting them to understand that you're not just playing the game because it's the easy way out to play a game, but you're playing a game, there's there's a purpose for it, there's a a, 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 a thing we're working on, be the tactic yeah. that we're trying to develop. Even you're talking about there about the the offensive mark, like that, getting the players to understand that. This game is about the offensive mark. It's not about getting the ball in and getting into the back of the net or over the bar. So I, I think getting that feedback piece is, is very good. Yeah, and but the last that, question, just, on, just, yeah. just on that, like, I mean, the, the easy way out is to go back and do the drills, line up four behind the cone and run in straight lines. That's the easy way out because you've got control. All right. That's the easy way out. And the players want it. It's not just Barry Milan telling you that you should play games. Research has shown that players want it. GA players. You know, there's, there's great games based research from Australia and the UK with top ac academics. But, you know, Damien Young, Paul Knurk, um, they've done the re Irish research on on hurlers and footballers. Players want this. They do, yeah. And um, we'd see that in, in with, even with squads and Barry and John and David inside in the schools. And, you know, like you said, that even at the, at the camps and that, you, that's when you hear the activity in the buzz and, and you know people are looking to go back to, it, to that and hopefully we'll be back at that next week from, from then on. Um, one last question Barry and, and we wrap up at this stage and, and you, you're quite good on the technology end of it and, and obviously with, with DD Sports you use quite scientific apps on that. Is it easy for a coach um, the likes of myself who's not the most technically minded but maybe to, to download some of these apps or to, to you know get get an app even if, if you purchase an app and, and to set up your own activities that you might be able to share in your group of so like we're all working in groups of five or six and we have our coaches whatsapp group that we share our, our sessions and our planning stuff and that is it easy enough for for people who mightn't be technically minded or, or, or mightn't be that brilliant on that stuff to to use some of these apps and is there any in particular ones that that you might recommend that a coach could download relatively inexpensively and start working on, on some stuff on it um i use tactical pad and it's very user friendly. Um, you go in, you sign up. Um, I think it's free. I know if you want to share stuff like um, like what I do, I think it's like it's twenty something per year, but it's well worth it because you'll find yourself on it an awful lot. It's just it's it's just so, so user friendly. Does you if you Google it, GA Tactical Pad. Um, I have I did a webinar for that for them during the summer, uh, and it goes through how to use it. Um, if you go on to Daily Sports Science, I think Joe has done one as well on a kind of a tutorial. Other than that, I mean, get yourself a, a um, I thought I had it there, don't a whiteboard, you know, a, a, or a tactics board, and you know, just draw out your session. Or you know, if you want to share something with the group, just take a picture of it and put it in, stuff like yeah. that. If you, if you if you don't want to go on to the the iPad or the phone and have tactical pad, um, there's another one called. Um, it's called it's a coach note or something like that. Or uh, I think it was coach note, Barry. Yeah, yeah, I think that's there as well. And um, and then there's another one. Then I use so if you've got an, an an Apple pencil or something like that, it's called um Nebo N E B O, and it's just like you can just draw <coughs> and share shares uh, easily. You can just draw it out, but you know, draw out your session. If that's what you want to do. You can screenshot it. Screenshot your drawing, put it into the WhatsApp group. You know, yeah. it could be, yeah, yeah. And I suppose, and, and it's, that that's a really good way of people, even the even the little tactics boards. And we we've given them to some of our development squads before, and they they found them handy. But it's a great way of making sure that you can keep you keep the activity that you don't. You know, we're all great for writing it down a piece of paper, but a piece of paper gets lost somewhere. But you know, taking it, sharing it in the WhatsApp group, you can refer back to it then later on in the season or the following season, and and develop on the activity in that. So. 
yeah, yeah. that's good that, that the tactical pad seems to be quite a, a good one and like your your activities are the stuff you showed up there this evening and the videos and that they're, they're easy understood and they're, they're quite good and you always see the stuff you put up every week with your your text boxes and, and stuff with it so they're, they're, they're quite easy to go with and mm. um, i think we're coming we're, we're 20 past eight uh, ladies and gentlemen we're, we're about an hour 15 now and 20 minutes into tonight's session we could stay for another couple of hours and i'm quite sure that um, we get bucket loads of more information from Barry. It's been a fascinating session and um, another one to go with our, in, in our series. This is the sixth one we've had so far and, and, and we, we've had a, a huge amount of, of uh, good feedback from people and engagement with people both on the sessions and people watching them back on, on, on the, uh, the YouTube after. So um, thanks for to everybody who's put in the, the questions and answer uh, the questions and to Barry for presentation and the answers. And I'll just hand back to Barry Dunn just to, to close off and to give information about our last webinar and, and the format that's going to take. So um, thanks to both Barrys. And so brilliant stuff. Thanks very much, Owen. Um, so look, I suppose we'll pretty much wrap it up there. So um, absolutely fantastic way to to, uh, to to finish up there. The questions, the standard the questions that came in and the answers that Barry gave. Um, Really, really interesting, really, really fascinating. I hope everybody who was on the call took a good bit away from it. I know I took a pile away from it myself. Um, like we had over 80 people who signed up for this webinar who, who were either watching it live or will watch it back. You can obviously watch it back on demand. And obviously we'll have this webinar up on YouTube as soon as we can. We'll try and, and try and get up tomorrow morning if we possibly can for anybody who, who missed some of it or, or who missed it and wants to kind of watch it back. Um, our next webinar will be, um, well, actually won't be a live webinar, but it'll be a pre-recorded one, but it'll be a really interesting one. It's um, it's about game-based or uh, game day warm-up activities. And it's with John, John Welch and Dave Robinson. Um, so that we're hoping to have that up on YouTube probably by the end of next week. Um, so again, that should be a really fascinating watch. Lots of practical examples for people um, as we're going back into um, activity again. Just loads of ideas for your warm ups, whatever, probably suitable for youth and adult coaches if possible. Um, but so that's that's something to look forward to again. So next week, if you want to watch any of the videos back that we've had over the last few weeks, they're all on our Data Oak Development YouTube page. Um, there's loads of other content up there as well. Um, we're after getting a, a pile of people on looking at different videos and, and we really appreciate you all taking the time to have a look at our videos. Just to give a plug for Barry's games based uh, book as well i'm sure uh, so um you can get that i assume is it true dd sports science you can get that barry yeah um or if, if look if anyone follows me on twitter you can just the pin tweet the, the link is there and it takes you right in uh, or else on the website you go into products i think it, yeah and it's it's there there's two games there's, there's one for football and there's one for hurling but mine's better <laughs> Of course, Barry, that, that, that goes without saying. So, um, yeah, so like give Barry a follow, look at his stuff with Daily Sports Science and, and definitely get your hands on that book. I'm sure it would be well worth uh, a purchase. So before we just wrap up, I just want to say one final thank you to Barry. Barry, thank you very much for your time. I know you put in a lot of work uh, on the presentation and and um, you can see that in, in, in the quality of the presentation. We really, really appreciate it. And uh, no doubt we'll get you uh, back again at some stage to probably do another webinar uh, down the line. So we leave it at that. So, folks, thank you very much for tuning in. We hope you enjoyed it. Thanks again to Barry. Thanks to Owen Burn, not for his help as well. And uh, we'll see you all soon. Thank you very much.